Welcome to the Mindset Game Podcast. I'm Verit Kogan, and it is a thrill and an honor to welcome Nadia Jeksenbaeva. Nadia is the founder and chief reinvention officer at the Reinvention Academy. She is a scientist, entrepreneur, and author specializing in resilience and reinvention. As a consultant and educator, Nadia helped companies such as Coca-Cola, Cisco, L'Oreal Group, and others to reinvent their products, their leadership practices, and business models to meet new market demands and prepare for incoming disruptions. As a speaker, she has delivered keynotes and workshops to over 500,000 executives, as well as delivering four excellent TED Talks. I've heard them, so I can vouch for that. Excellent TED Talks. And her How to Kill Your Own Company TEDx Talk has around 350,000 views. As an author, Nadia has written several award-winning books, most recently, The Chief Reinvention Officer Handbook, How to Thrive in Chaos. And her work has been featured in a variety of publications, including the Harvard Business Review, Forbes, the European Financial Review, and so on. And so, Nadia, it truly is a great honor to have you here. And I believe that the leaders who are listening, whether it's corporate leaders, leaders in their families, in their communities, uh, we all need to hear your message. So welcome. Thank you so much. My honor is to be here. Would it be all right if we start with, what do you mean by reinvention? It's a great question, and I will take a touch of detour. But before the detour, I'll answer it simply. Reinvention is an emerging field of science, all focused on one question. How do we thrive in volatility and uncertainty? And as a standard approach to management science, this is me as a scientist speaking, most of what we've developed in this relatively recent history, management science, if you think about the very first business school, that's beginning of 20th century, just over 100 years ago. So we didn't really have that much time to develop. But most of that 100 years, we developed theory, methodology, tools, solutions for very stable, predictable, slow-moving certain world. And no wonder why most of us feeling overwhelmed right now. Those tools are no longer working. And that strategy, while it was amazing 50 years ago, is simply not built specifically for conditions of chaotic systems, mm -hmm. um, for conditions of uncertainty and volatility. So what we do with the reinvention movement, we are working on a range of solutions across all functional areas and industries that help us thrive in chaos, not just survive uncertainty and disruption, but actually use it to reinvent, to renew and become stronger. Thank you. And it really is such important work. As you said, people are overwhelmed. Systems are overwhelmed. Uh, there is depletion all over the board. And so let's start with kind of the end in mind. What is the kind of most important message that you want listeners to get from our conversation today? I think the most important message is that we have to give up an idea that the volatility, uncertainty, and disruption that we're feeling every day, whether it's a competitor or technological, if it's not technological, then it's a regulation. If it's not regulation, it's supply chain problem. If not supply chain problem, it's inflation. If it's not inflation, it's a war. If it's not a war, it's COVID. If it's not COVID, it's a recession. Whatever it is that is touching you today, the idea that this is temporary, that this will pass, is no longer a valid idea. And I've been listening to this, you know, when things normalize, let's just tighten our belts until things get back to normal. We've been waiting for this for 15 years since the last economic recession. 2008 was 15 years ago. And there's zero evidence from the point of view of scientific research that suggests that things will quiet down, normalize, or slow down. So then our first and foremost question is to stop thinking, how do we survive until things normalize? and start thinking, how do we thrive in a constantly disrupted, uncertain and volatile world? And the moment we shift the language and the question is when we start thinking of a new rules of the game that could be quite enjoyable, not a sense of punishment, dread that we often feel right now. 
Brilliant. And and that is the essence of the game. This podcast is called the mindset game, because once we get that and we expect change and we welcome it because it brings growth and reinvention, if you will, um, then then we can have uh, lightness around it because we have tools. And I know that you uh, are very conscious about giving a whole variety of tools for people. And so what might be some of those tools, or at least uh, just a little uh, introduction to them that could help people accept this idea and and find a little bit more ease around leaning towards change? So we do have tools that are more in a mindset culture category that help organization rethink or individuals rethink what's going on. And with a new set of assumptions, start playing the new game very differently. I often give an example of um, snow. So if you live in Florida and it snows once every 100 years, would you look at snow as a threat or as an opportunity? Absolutely not. Would you have cars that are winter tire ready? Would you have shovels? Would you have warm clothes? It's a waste of your energy and money and time. Why would you? And the same with opportunity. Would you start building skiing resorts? Absolutely not. But if it snows every day or if it snows regularly or every season uh, or most of the year, as it does in many regions in the world, all of those activities are actually reasonable and thoughtful. So your assumptions about frequency of change changes your complete relationship with change. And most of us assume is that change, that's something that happens very rarely. That's what we assume, that this is something that happens rarely, that is a project we need to endure, and then we go to the normal life. And today, reinvention is very much like taking a shower. If mm-hmm. I don't take a shower on a regular basis, I begin to stink. If I don't renew my product services, my assumptions, my team rules, my personal career rules, they begin to stink as well. Yeah, I love that. Thank you. And, you know, I think it's brilliant that you offer these kind of mindset tools to to shift our thinking, Mm -hmm. because once we know the truth about certain patterns and rhythms, if you will, then as you share, you know, then we can know a little bit more again about what to expect. And that allows us to feel safer and therefore to feel a little less uh, anxious, you know, and, and, and then, of course, to make better decisions that will help us to get the results that we want. And it's not only on the soft side. We're talking about dollars and cents. We're talking about speed. So whenever we are resistant to change, we are losing valuable time. And we do a lot of research in Reinvention Academy. Our 2022 research was just completed in that study. And we track it now in 2018, 2020, 2022. We see that today, 21% of companies need to reinvent every 12 months or less to thrive in today's disruptive environment. And that is significant jump from 16% just two years ago during COVID. So we are looking at the high, high speed of change. And that's why mindset, culture, systems, those are very crucial tools, but they're not enough. We also are integrating the best of what science has to offer with some of our own tools in three buckets. So to be very good at this, you have to cover all three buckets. One of them is anticipating change, getting very better, very, very better. You see, it's been a long day, (laughs) much better. My English is disappearing. To getting much better at anticipating change through better forecasting, through better uh, work with futurists, through better ear to the ground, noticing the trends early with economic forecasts, social behavioral forecasts, marketing forecasts, and so on. So it's anticipating change. The second bucket is all the disciplines around designing change. If anticipating change traditionally has been foresight, strategy, designing change has traditionally been innovation, design thinking, um, specific methodologies such as appreciative inquiry or future search. There are many different tools we have with the creative work of designing change. And it's not often a big friend of the previous bucket. Mm -hmm. Strategists rarely get their hands dirty playing with the creative ideas. 
and they are also not enough anticipating designing we also need to add tools in the implementation implementing change and here we have a collection of tools you can go traditional route with project management and change management or the new fresh route with agile with scrum with other methodologies but you have to make sure all these three areas are working as a well-oiled machine and traditionally this different fields have been not exactly the friends. If anything, in most organizations, I'm grossly exaggerating, but in most organizations, they're a bit skeptical about it, uh, each other. They're a bit pointing fingers at each other rather than creating a process that produces real, real, reliable results. So what can we do about that as, as leaders, influencers? There are a few things that successful leaders and successful organizations do when they want to thrive in chaos and be excellent in turbulence. And research is very conclusive about that. There are a number of great articles um, that have been published studying extreme crisis, especially worldwide recessions. And the studies conclude that in a typical massive recession, about 17% of companies do not survive. That's pretty expected, right? 17% die, the middle ground is somewhere in between, but the much more interesting number is between 9 and 10%, not just survive, they thrive, they flourish, they grow across every criteria you can imagine. And our job at Reinvention Academy is to make sure you're in that 10%. So what do they do? Number one, they stop thinking of change as a one-time project that happens occasionally and start thinking of reinvention as a process, the way you manage anything else in your company, in your life. If you are brushing teeth on a regular basis, you are reinventing on a regular basis. If you have a good, well-oiled budgeting process, you have to have a good, well-oiled reinvention process. And that's why we see so many companies showing the commitment and the thoughtfulness around it with the establishment of a chief reinvention officer, establishing a chief transformation officer, whatever is the language that fits your culture. But it's exciting to see that we even see at the level of public sector, I think it was the state of North Dakota that had its first chief reinvention officer at the state level. So it's becoming more of understanding that this cannot be a side story. This cannot be something we do on the weekends for 10 minutes. We are at the stage where unless we have a well-oiled machine around renewal and reinvention, we will miss the boat very, very quickly. So whether it is putting a dedicated group of people or a person or resources, or it's creating dedicated time, not all of us have a luxury of creating a separate function. Dedicated time means every few weeks, every week, every month, we have a dedicated time to really invest in anticipating, designing, and implementing. Anticipating, designing, and implementing. Just like you take the shower, there has to be regular, there has to be uh, a kind of sense of normalcy and automation around it. It shouldn't be a big shock to us that oh, it's time to reinvent. Of course, we will have to reinvent again and again and again. So what about cultures that are change resistant, right? Mm -hmm. So let's say they tried things in the past, things didn't work out or as quickly as they wished. And, you know, people are overwhelmed and they're stressed out and they just don't want to deal with any more change. So what can we do about that if we know in concept that we need to reinvent, but our people are not open to that? Yeah. So resistance to change is, generally speaking, in most organizations, a very healthy sign. Mm -hmm. uh, I would be very surprised if I enter a company as a consultant or I come as an educator and I bring the news of change to the company that everyone says, yay, thank you that you're here. No, that's generally speaking unhealthy. So if you have a healthy level of resistance, I'm not talking about um, you know, sabotage. I'm talking about healthy level of skepticism and resistance, completely normal. Usually if I don't see it, I start creating or kind of poking the bear to make sure that the company wakes up because a healthy company is usually has a healthy level of resistance. We don't accept every idea. We shouldn't accept everything that is coming our way. And we should be open and transparent and have enough trust and respect to have those critical voices heard, that will protect us better. 
What you're talking about is the recent research, however, that Gallup has published in 2022 that we all feel and see that today we are seeing the highest level of fatigue, burnout, and stress that we've ever seen in the history of research we've ever done. That is different. That is not a healthy level of resistance. That is not normal. And one of the reasons this is happening brings us back to mindset and why your podcast is so important. A lot of fatigue and burnout, this learned helplessness and learned hopelessness that we see comes from the mindset. If I believe that change should be rare, if I believe that change is a project, there is a beginning, middle, and the end, and then long life without change. If that is my belief, and life is consistently telling me this is not the case. If in my company, change comes in fast waves and I have to constantly adapt, I begin to get completely and absolutely frustrated. It feels like I'm lied to. You promised me I will change one time and life will be better and it's never better. I feel like nothing ever improves. I feel like I'm completely losing my ground and I'm no longer an expert or my leader is no longer the expert because they don't know what to do. Clearly, it's a mess. It's a whole bunch of um, assumptions around what is good and what is bad that is all based on our mindset and our beliefs. And that's why without the mindset work, it's very hard to help our employees. Once they start seeing that this is the new normal, once they start seeing that you don't have a choice. There is no choice to change or not to change. The choice today is not, should I change this time and again in a few months and again in months, or can I just wait it out? That is non-existent. The only choice, either you will voluntarily participate and be the driver of your own life, or you will be dragged into new reality, kicking and screaming, and somebody else will choose for you. It's the new technology, it's the AI, it's the regulator, it's the competitor, it's your customer who will choose for you, but there is no choice not to change. You can be very angry about it, you can be very upset about it, too bad. And that's the kind of maturity and ownership of our own life that is required of us today. And it is hard. I'm not saying it's easy. I am studying this for what is now 22 years, right? My PhD was 2001. I lived through massive change. And I'm not talking about, you know, my boss change. My country disappeared under my feet. I woke up one day. There was no government. There was no police. There was no ministries. And we were so unprepared for the collapse of Soviet Union and our um, home backyard of Kazakhstan that we couldn't get our currency for almost three years. Can you imagine living in a country that has no currency for almost three years and still somehow making it happen? We use currencies of neighboring countries because we had no capabilities, no know-how of how do you create your own monetary system, your own national bank, and so on. So I'm not talking about tiny changes. I'm talking about massive fundamental changes in the personal life and the professional life and the societal life. And I'm still struggling. There are days where I'm like, I don't want this. It's enough. Can I just take a break? Can I please not change right now? So I get it. I get the sense of fatigue. And a lot of it comes from the mindset, not from our wiring. And I know this because my, as a scientist, I have to look at the research on neuroscience. I have to look at research in biology. And all I know in my work in that field is babies are wired to be okay with uncertainty. There is no baby if they're healthy and normal that wakes up at uh, one week old and demands a detailed agenda of the next 12 months. They, nobody needs that kind of predictability. I'm sorry. They're fine not knowing. They're completely fine not knowing what's for lunch. It's usually milk. But they're completely fine not knowing, right? And the babies usually are not the kind of people who need a bonus to start walking. You don't need to train them. You don't need to entice them. Reinvention is hardwired into who we are. We're just educated out of it. And it's about reclaiming our native capacity rather than introducing something very foreign to us. It's actually the mindset of stability is good, biologically speaking, that is foreign to any living system. Every single living system is in a flux 
on a daily basis. We go up and down, our heartbeat goes up and down, we breathe in and breathe out, we go through leaves are growing to leaves are falling, we go through um, it's dark, it's light, it's cold, it's hot. This is the biological norm. And for some reason, we decided that we can live outside of what billions of years of evolution have provided for our systems. So well said. Thank you, Nadia. And and I absolutely agree that you even use the example of breathing in, breathing out, the, the polarity, right? So if we look at it as stability versus change or transformation, reinvention, we need both. And so I honor you for valuing the the resistance, the healthy resistance in organizations, because there is wisdom in in the current ways that we want to hold on to. And of course, we also need to be able to adapt. Um, it's not one or the other. It's like not right hand versus left hand. We need both. And over time, uh, you know, a healthy organization, a healthy system, even in our own bodies, right, just like breathing in and out, right, is is really about uh, honoring both. So not one at the ne neglect of the other, so to speak. And so, um, you know, one of the things that uh, I find particularly interesting is how do our own kind of personal mindsets about our ability to adapt to change, our ability to learn things, and how does that come into it? Oh, it's the crucial and fundamental, it's the foundational. And your point about the balancing of polarities is so important. Well, when everyone asks me, why did I choose the word reinvention instead of, let's say, innovation or instead of change or instead of something else? The issue is that all of those words are very important. And the theoretical and pragmatic practical work done in those fields is crucial. But we need both end. Reinvention is valuing and preserving the best of the old while adding the new and there's two tracks that we work on with the reinvention toolkit one is how do we manage change but also there's a second one how do we manage continuity what do we not throw with the bathwater? what do we make sure we preserve and it's never compromisable never um up, up for grabs, never can be thrown away. And once an individual knows what I often call it, a red line. So through all your cycles of reinvention, all your lives and all your roles and all your career changes. So in the company, through all your product portfolios, your all your versions of yourself, org designs and so on, what remained as a red line connecting all of those? Once you know your red line individually or collectively, it's very easy to reinvent, very easy to reinvent because you don't feel like you're losing yourself. It's easy if you know what you're about, it's easy to try this and that because you are not losing yourself. You're not selling your soul. You are not giving it away. I often give an example of Philips as a corporation. Mm -hmm. And Philips had many reincarnations just in the last 30 years, 25 years. 25 years ago, Philips was most known for its TVs. And then in 2005, they were doing very good with um, idea of lighting and wellness. And then they moved them to completely different territory, which is medical equipment. And you're like, why in the hell medical equipment? You were in a completely different field. Well, it's very natural. They were excellent at the quality of imaging. And they were not so excellent at uh, consumer marketing. Which field do you need amazing quality of image? but do not need consumer marketing in a place where a tiny image of a cancer cell can make a life or death difference. And that's how they went into imaging technology for medical equipment. Now, what remained the same? The quality of image all depends on the physics of light. Their red line has always been about physics of light. And then you can apply it in this industry and that, consumer technology, medical, space travel, wherever you need physics of light, you don't feel like you're compromising yourself or selling your soul. You don't feel like you're losing anything. It actually feels like a playground. So continuity management and change management, that becomes crucial. And that's where mindset is so important, that we need to have clarity about what do we believe in around change? Are we all for preserving what is? All for bringing always new? Or can we find... Uh, joyful medium, a balancing act between the two 
and have a different assumption and different set of rules around change altogether. Yeah, and I and again, I think it's so important to honor all of the voices around the table, so to speak, because they're, they're all important. And, and we need to know what people are really thinking and feeling and believing so that number one, in, in whatever actions and strategies we do implement, that they are solving an actual issue or problem and not something that we assume is, but is actually not what people are thinking, right? So we, we've got to get the truth of what is really uh, you know, uh, in the minds and hearts of, of the people who are impacted by the change. And I think it's also important to have some systems in place to recognize what are the warning signs when we're getting a little bit too far away from that red line, you know, little the lights need to go off. What, what are those warning signs and what systems do we have in place to make sure that we don't, you know, get too far from that so that we lose our our edge or that thing that that you know is as you said most important for us to hold on to that has made us who we are the core core of the organization and of course to take actions to leverage the benefits um, of both continuity and change so (laughs) this is by the way such a, a treat to talk to you because you really get this so oftentimes um, a lot of people believe that, you know, we we need to do certain actions to influence people to do certain things. And of course, you know, with change uh, and leadership, we, we do need to have, um, uh, you know, momentum towards a particular coherent direction, a coherent vision and so on. But oftentimes people, leaders are so focused on the end point, as you said, like a change has a start and an end. And oftentimes they're already at the end when people are still barely at the start and, and not really, you know, in tune with what people are feeling. And, and they forget that it really is a non-ending kind of thing. It is a process and it's a beautiful process. Um, and when we have limited resources, it's hard to see it that way because we're fighting fires and we're barely completing one change before we need to, you know, deal with another um, so, so what advice do you have for leaders that are right now in that place? They're saying, Nadia, I get this. I see what you're saying. It would be amazing to be able to reinvent every two, three years. And it's just not possible for my organization. You think number one, be easy on yourself. You are a reinventing right now. You've been a reinventor all your life. There has not been a single company, and I worked with hundreds, that I entered. And when I asked them to start drafting their cycles when they reinvented, that a single company had one cycle to show me in their entire life. No, every single one, when they put their mind to it, begin to see the pattern that they've done the leaps again and again, and they're good at reinvention. They just don't celebrate it. They don't call it that way. They don't give it any, you know, it's assumed like, What's a big deal? You know, it's not like we flew to the moon, unless you are a few of those who did flew, fly recently places. Um, it's not like we had some sort of massive rocket science situation here. So number one, become easy, get easy on yourself and spending a little bit of time charting up your own reinvention cycles, the life cycles of your business model, your organization, you will see that you've done tremendous work reinventing yourself. Otherwise, you wouldn't be here. We have plenty of statistics to show what is the speed of death in organizations simply by the fact that your company is still there is a sure sign that you have been reinvented. Second, concentrate on quick wins. Reinvention should not be a burden. It should be something that lightens your burden. It should be something that makes your life easier. So is there something in a very easy vicinity, a quick way and a low-hanging fruit that you can start with that will give you and your people the confidence and the competence that you need? Not only they will get better technically, but they will feel more hope that they will feel more inspiration. Yes, we can change things. And it can start with as simple as let's change the way we run meetings or let's change the way we have Friday mornings or how we write email. Something completely reachable and something that is obvious fix that really will bring a benefit in your organization. Third, so one, celebrate yourself a little bit more, get a little bit easier on yourself. Two, 
quick wins. Three, the simplest hack that makes humongous difference is stop thinking of things you do right now as a hardcore decisions. You know, we need to make the right decision. We cannot afford to fail. We cannot, you know, it's a decision. Versus looking at everything as an experiment. I cannot tell you how often, whenever I'm in a meeting and we need to make a decision, it becomes hard. There's a lot of fear involved. Why, what if we make a wrong decision? We make a decision based on today's assumptions and tomorrow inflation happens, exchange rates happen, supply chain prices happen, something else happen, and all these decisions are crap. Uh, who is going to be held responsible and on and on. Instead of looking at it as a decision, if you start framing it as an experiment, right? let's run an experiment for a while and then see if this is something that we want to sustain. It leaves a lot of burden out of the room. It means biologically, neuroscience-wise, in terms of your ability to think creatively, the blood is back in the brain. Your people can hear each other again. All the things that we know from the biology of stress, it's all reversed in the moment we don't put that pressure, you know, make a perfect decision versus let's run an experiment. So that's number three. And very final four, We've done enough research. It's been now researched and published more than once. I recently published an article in Harvard Business Review specifically with that um, reference to that research on flexibility and our planning and budgeting. And this hack is very simple. Start setting goals and ranges. Instead of setting a goal as a singular number, let's say we need to reach this number by the end of a week. If you give yourself a range, it's a magic how much power, flexibility, sense of hope, and so on it gives. And research is very conclusive. It includes, increases the likelihood of you sticking with the task um, 30 to 50%, just because it's not black and white anymore. It's not like if you miss it by 1%, you fail. No, if you are anywhere within the range, it's a wild success, let's celebrate. So those would be the four um, guidelines for hacks that I could offer right now for those of you who are a bit weary and tired of reinvention. Thank you. And all four are just wonderful. Uh, I'd never heard that last one around kind of the range of research around that. So that's fascinating to me. Um, and, and, and I love that you're sharing, first of all, a little bit of that self-compassion, right? Mm -hmm. That first one, because I think that oftentimes there is so much attachment as you said, to the particular outcome or to a particular endpoint versus a range that, that we tend to put too much meaning or significance onto that outcome. And, and, it, and then we get into fear. And as you know, from neuroscience, when we're in fear, when we're incoherent, we're not really thinking clearly, individually and collectively, we're not intuiting the best decisions uh, and, and really giving ourselves the best shot to reinvent our company in a way that is truly unique and different, higher, if you will, than anything we've done or maybe others perhaps have even done. So, so I love that there is that piece of, of kind of detachment because that is safety for the body. And mm -hmm. I think that's true for us personally too. Anytime I think we experience a depleting kind of negative emotion, it's when there is a little bit too much attachment given to something. Mm -hmm. um, and so when we just allow ourselves to take things to breathe, to just take things a little bit more lightly, you know, then we're able to kind of see a little bit of a wider perspective, have a little more objectivity. Um, so, so how can people do that? Let's just say if somebody's listening, all right, like, how do I actually do this? Well, first, I want to say, how do you actually manage yourself to be prepared to reinvent and then a few words on the reinvention itself? On the prepared side, um, it's very important to know that and re remember, we all know it, that we know we took biology courses. So we remember the fight or flight syndrome. We understand how it works. It's just hard to remember in the moment when we are in the fight or flight. It's important to remember that we are wired in a way that our emotions are always incomparably fast and stronger than our intellect. And I always give this example if any of you who are listening are drivers. Remember the last time you were sitting in a passenger seat and the driver was doing something crazy. Just remember that moment. What was your body doing? And I guarantee in 99% of us, we were braking. Our body was pushing an imaginary brake. All of us are educated people, highly successful. 
we are not stupid by any means. When we sat down in that passenger seat, our brain recognized that there is no button to push. There is no brake. But our emotions override our body and the body pushes an imaginary brake even though our brain is like, there is no brake there. It's so much faster. So the idea that we can override it or pretend that we don't feel anything or push our feelings aside or there is no room for feelings in business that is biologically impossible. If you're a normal, healthy human being, your emotion will override your rational brain every time. It's just a norm. That just means you're healthy, you're normal, congratulations. And pretending otherwise is doing yourself a disservice because we have a misconception, we have a mindset shift necessary around the concept of fear. Most of that time, we try to suppress our fear because there's a shame associated with it. There is a sense of this is weakness or this is... um lack of courage, that this is um, this is something about me being a coward. And there is nothing further from the truth. Fear is exact opposite. Fear is our body telling us, right now, you're going to be a hero. You're facing a threat. And I am mobilizing your body to either kill the threat or run away from the threat, but survive. So right now, you and I, are going to have a little battle and we will survive. Mm -hmm. So it's exact opposite of being a coward. It's exact opposite of anything to be ashamed of because fear is a sign of our body preparing to be a hero. And that reframe helps you get much more successful and um, productive with your own fear. When you're feeling fear, it means something important is happening. You need to mobilize. Great. Thank you for giving me a sign before my brain recognizes it. You, my body is giving me a sign before my brain can even recognize. Thank you. Good job, body. And then move into a productive action and so on. So first of all, reframing our relationship and fear, let the fear run through us, say thank you and start doing the action, mobilized action to address whatever is giving us a threat, giving us a sense of something is going in the wrong direction. Now, when it comes to how do we do reinvention, uh, we often say start with very, very simple routine things, which is anticipate change, design change, implement change. Anticipate change, ear to the ground, try to make a map of what was necessary before and what seems to be necessary now. And every few months, we're hosting a free event called Easy Reinvention Lab. I know you participated. We teach those tools. Uh, it's free. It's open. It's our part of our big 1 billion people mission. We want 1 billion people with resilience and reinvention skills. So Wednesday part of the lab is where we show you how to use the classic Blue Ocean Strategy Canvas specifically in a unique way to use it for customer research and hearing what needs to be changed, whether internal, customer, or external. And then you go through a number of brainstorming exercises to design a good change, and then you move towards implementation. So uh, you have the tools, you just need to put them into the right sequence and um, get a, a sense going of creating a pool of ideas that you will test out as experiments, throw which ones are not working, Keep the ones that go and repeat. Rinse and repeat. Rinse and repeat. That's uh, that's the process of reinvention. Thank you. And it is an extraordinary reinvention lab. And I really honor you for that. And I invite people to explore that and see how they can engage with that. So one last question here. What would you want to give as advice for a newborn into this beautiful world of ours? What does he or she really need to know? Well, number one is you got it. As a mom, my daughter is 19, a little bit further from a newborn. But as a mom, looking at her story, she got it. This is her na native capacity to live a full life, to test out, to experiment, and to thrive in complete uncertainty. This is how we are hardwired, and this is what we come with. I also think this is a beautiful era. A lot of shoes and musts and, you know, you have to, are disappearing very quickly. The freedoms that she's experiencing are incomparable to the freedoms I experienced. And I experienced tons of freedom compared to my parents behind Iron Curtain. My parents have never been outside of a country before the collapse of Soviet Union because it was prohibited. 
And in that sense, my freedoms are incomparable to my ancestors. Uh, I recently read uh, in a bookstore, I think it was a mug or a journal, that we are our ancestors' wildest dreams. And I truly believe it, that just recognizing that our next generation, next generation are so prepared for a whole new world. So for the newborn, uh, I think the biggest question for all of us is to come back to uh, loving ourselves more, giving ourselves grace more, um, giving ourselves a minute, a second of rest in this very volatile and uncertain world, taking that moment to breathe. Uh, to truly, truly protect and honor ourselves and be kind to ourselves. That would be it. Everything else is yours. Just don't need to, an elephant in one seating. Give yourself a break and uh, give yourself a little bit of grace on a regular basis. Oh, thank you, Nadia. And if I may say just a quick point on what you read recently around kind of we being our ancestors' wildest dreams, if I caught that, one of the conversations that I happened to hear with you, uh, you spoke about, I forget if it's your grandfather or great-grandfather that stood up. And sadly, um, if, you, if you don't mind sharing that story. Of course. of course. I think that is a good way to tie up uh, on a personal story of leadership and the red line we discussed, this need for continuity. Um, very often I'm asked, why do I keep my last name, which is very hard to pronounce as you experience yourself. And my last name comes from my ancestors, from my region. And I live in the U.S. since 98. So I am asked to make it more U.S. friendly Every few weeks, at least, there are some years that it was weekly requests from somebody in media or somebody in marketing. Can we make it shorter? Can we make it easier to pronounce? My last name is my daily source of strength because I come from the lineage where almost everyone was executed, not just had a hardship executed or tortured and then killed themselves. So my great-grandfather lived through a famine artificially designed by the government to clear up the land from the people, to repopulate it with a different uh, group of people. So 40% of all Kazakhs were murdered in that way in the 1920s, 1930s. And recently, a wonderful article in Wall Street Journal was published about forgotten famine of Kazakhstan. And I honor the scientists who are trying to speak this truth as this been less than 100 years for us, 40% of the country murdered. My great-grandfather survived the famine, but he spoke against the government activities and he was executed as an enemy of the state. And my grandfather ended up being in an orphanage house in Russia in a language he did not speak. And an official title, son of the enemy of the state, was a forever attached to him, which means he is not allowed to live in a major city. He is not allowed to have many careers. He has to be uh, on an official report with the police and on and on and on. He became a journalist, spoke against the regime, put in jail, tortured many times, killed himself before I was born. So my last name is a reminder for me. You think you got it hard, girl? Get yourself together. You've seen nothing yet. You've seen no hardship of any kind. And whatever grievances you have with life, get a grip because look at what they had to survive. So you have the luxury of sitting here with nice computers and whatever else I have on my walls, doing whatever you are doing, get a grip. So I think we all have to find that kind of strength in ourselves and so that kind of reminder in ourselves because it's very easy to get comfortable and to forget. It's very easy to start getting the immense life we all have for granted. And, you know, Put it aside and say, you know, that's nothing. Well, if I had whatever, better job, better title, better brand, better, whatever better we want. But having that red line is a very, very important instrument in my life. And I invite each leader to spend a little bit of time asking what in my life is unbreakable, unshakable, uncompromisable, and can never be taken away from me. It will give you a lot of strengths in hard times. Thank you, Nadia. All my love to you. And I'm certain that you are living well beyond your whole family's wildest dreams. And it sounds like even your own. And I honor you for that. How can people learn even more about the beautiful work that you do in our world? 
Well, we are excited to share our materials and resources because we have a big mission. And for big mission, we need you to use our materials and go into the world and do big things. All of the materials we put together are in an open source format, meaning that whenever you study with us, you have a permission and license from us as long as you cite the source to send this to the world and use all of our tools. Our website is learn to reinvent, learn number two reinvent. You can also just Google chief reinvention officer. That's another website we have. And you will find tons of materials, including an 85 page preview of this book that you mentioned. It was the 21 Axiom Business Book of the Year. It got a couple of other awards. It is, as you can see, I use it. Uh, it is a handbook. So you get tools, you get cases, you get workbook exercises, you do a lot of hands-on work. So you can get 85 pages of free preview, whichever of the two sites you go to. And we would love to get your feedback on that book. Well, once again, I honor this incredible mission. And I think that you follow in your family's footsteps of um, helping our world to, to be more free, free of those attachments, regarding change and free to reinvent and create more solutions in our world, which we very much need right now. So all my love again, and please continue to do what you do. Thank you so much for having me.